Title Felix Guattari on Drugs It's hard to start with a clear definition of drugs. In fact, it's more a phenomenon to consider at the level of specific social rapport, an attitude of society toward individuals, an attitude of individuals toward themselves. It certainly may be a large definition. It's social, it's micro-social that we should adopt. If not, it's really difficult to circumscribe what is a drug, where a drug starts, where a drug ends. It's an absurd debate between soft drugs, heavy drugs. Of course, there are I don't know how many ways to drug yourself. For example, in relation to food, we can drug ourselves by being bulimic, by eating a lot, or vice versa, we can drug ourselves by not eating at all, anorexia. For example, I've always thought that one of the inspiration techniques of Franz Kafka was a drug that he secreted himself. I didn't take drugs, he avoided that, but he drugged himself with a sort of anorexia or by insomnia. The fact of not sleeping, he was putting himself in an alternative state of mind. Or with the cold, for example, for certain sadomasochism, there's a specific relation to cold that exists. We could imagine finding a common trait thinking that drugs are a way to seize oneself, to withdraw into oneself, a way to cut yourself from a certain relation to time to the other. Maybe then we'll come to distinguish more precisely what are the psychophysiological mechanisms of drugs. Like you know, in your investigation, talking to the interviewer, recent scientific work has shown that the organism secret itself the equivalent of drugs that we know, heroin, its secret morphine, what we call endomorphine. It means that painful situations end up in secretion of intracerebral hormone. We can imagine that there are a certain number of situations, individual and psychological, where we secrete our own response to anguish. Our own physiological response, it's a path on which I can't say much, since it's not my specialty, and because those works are quite recent. But the important point is not to seize, to propose a definition of drugs at that physiological level, but above all, to see at what type of phenomenon it corresponds to. It seems to me indisputable that a certain type of religious ritual is a kind of drug. I don't mean to say that Marx's formula Religion is the opium of the people, is to be understood to the letter, but from a certain situation, ritual. It's true that some rituals look like a situation of drug use. I remember, for example, having witnessed the activity of a cult in New York, video bug, a cult, not a voodoo kind of cult or stuff like that, but a cult in people's home, middle class people where a group of people repeated for hours the same sentences. A Japanese sentence, moreover, they didn't understand the meaning of the sentences because they didn't speak Japanese. They were repeating for hours, fast, very fast, never stopping. It's something they were saying, you cannot judge because do it to judge, you'll see the result. Obviously, I didn't agree to that because I don't know but it gave me a lot to reflect on. I told myself deep down, no doubt there's a certain result, and I wondered if it's not a result of a drug. We can take drugs by repeating a situation. We can take drugs not necessarily by the introduction of a chemical component, but by a ritual. In that case, it was a social ritual. But we can imagine repetitive rituals of a different nature. It can be music, where a rhythm might have the function of a drug or symptoms, as example, of obsessional neurosis, where someone repeats, repeats, repeats. I believe that drugs have something to do with a certain way to articulate time, what I would call to semiotize time. That is to say, it's certainly something that tends to shorten, to produce a territory, subjective, based on rhythm, based on relation to space, which constitutes some sort of protection, which develops 
a private universe in the world. So, there it is. That's how I would think about the question of drugs in a general way. Then we should see how they are socially adopted. What is social attitude, collective attitude law, dominant society related to that? There are drugs that are not only accepted, but recommended. When you think of, for example, the ceremony, Japanese, the ritual of sakin, well, there is, if we think about it, a social obligation to drink sake until being drunk in certain circumstances, with the head of services, the boss, etc. There are situations where drugs are imposed. Television is a kind of collective drug. I'm convinced that, regardless of the content of the message sent by the television, the phenomenon of pressing on the remote, the transfer of images, the way we behave, it works like a drug. And I believe that one day we'll discover that it's not a metaphor, but that effectively there's a secretion of endorphins. You know, there are studies done, I believe it's in the user, I don't know if it's in France, which consisted in asking every resident of a neighborhood, of a building, of a council house, of a working class neighborhood to accept to stop watching television. And sociologists studied that, they had to stop the experiment because it set it off the real phenomenon of craving. It was insupportable, it triggered trouble. To such an extent that scientists stopped the experience, we have seen what we needed to see. It's enough. So it shows that a certain relation to media is like a drug. It's like you were saying in your introduction, not only accepted drugs, but recommended imposed drugs. So now there are other sectors of drugs that aren't tolerated, that are frightening, that are repressed. I wouldn't do a priori the apology of hard drugs because I've seen enough people that have suffered to understand the challenge it represent, at least some hard drugs. Those are situations where people are completely isolated, trapped, and of course they don't call. That shouldn't call for repression. It's a pain. I don't see why we would repress someone with cancer or tuberculosis. To me it's absurd to treat someone like we sometimes treat addicts to put them in jail, to make them go through craving. It's shameful to beat someone because they have cancer or tuberculosis. That being said, it's not to make an apology for hard drugs because it's, I believe, a real problem. Those are two extremes. In between, there are situations where what we call drugs, or maybe we shouldn't, like marijuana, or if we have a wide definitions, we could be more economical for mental hygiene, individual mental economy. Instead of staying anxious, I don't see a problem if someone, to help them sleep or to feel good, smoke marijuana. It's a kind of drug or medication that's much more harmless than a lot of neuroleptic or medication that people take to sleep or fight anguish. But all that to say, that there's a wide umbrella of drugs. For me, drugs go from heroin, on one side, up to lipids, sugar, diet. There are people that drug themselves with candy. Really, it's a terrible effect, by the way. And then, there are all those intermediate drugs, social ones. So, once the definition enlarges in such a way, we're sent back, maybe, to a problem, even bigger which is to know why, what does it mean? What do these so-called drugs problems mean? It would bring us quite far. I don't know if it's part of your goals, but I would simply add a sentence. Sometimes we think of the adult world, the normal world, the white world, the industrial society like the end, the goals, the arrival of men's at maturity in their mind, in their relation to the world, rational, etc. I believe it's the other way around. I believe that sciences are incredible, and technology can bring a lot of freedom. But all in all, all those technologies, as much in social life as chemical techniques, communication, 
amount to a huge infantile regression. People are really trapped, programmed into situation, from birth to death, that drug them, cut them from that curious thing which is to be alive. It's quite strange. What does it mean to be on some kind of planet that has been there since a given time, and that we know it will come to an end in a certain manner, and all the possible experience and knowledge it represent? What are we doing here? What does it mean to continue a great line onto genetic, a great phylogenetic line? What's going on with sexual division? Having to learn things? What is it to be thrown, like that, in the cosmos? So that discussy could make me look crazy. What is he saying? We ask him to talk about drugs like a doctor or psychoanalyst should, and there he goes talking about cosmos, life and death. Well, I believe that's the point. How to not see, to not have contact, to hide under the pillow, to not see those realities around us. I believe that this is the more general definition of drug I would give. Given that the minoritarian, and creative use case of drugs, of some drugs, goes exactly against all that. The drugs that we repress are sometimes the drugs of a poet, for example, Andre Michaud. It's on the contrary, paradoxically, the exception that confirms the rule. Namely, if we imagine a line of flight, we can find, in some situation of drugs, something that throws you back again into the world, into the cosmos, in the reality of life and death, of sexual relation, the relation to other, to time, to the body, etc. What I'm saying might be a bit confusing, but I think we cannot really understand social attitudes related to drugs if we do not situate it in this huge enterprise of normalization, of repetition, of programmation of individuals. And the drug-related phenomenon that we repress are paradoxically those who escape other drugs. In other words, there are enough imposed drugs out there, so don't go look for minoritarian drugs, drugs that help you escape the ubiquitous one offered by society. Here is simply put my answer. Interviewer, if a government separate distinguish legal drugs in a country, there are reasons for that. It's not innocent, it's not to protect people, but there are specific intentions behind that. I don't know. Guattari. Economical, political, yes. But I see morale and metaphysical reasons. Again, drugs, madness, some sexual practices. You have a problem with transvestites in Greece. I've been there not long ago, and transvestites told me how, even under a socialist regime, repression continued may be less violent than under the previous government, but still. All those are like witch hunts in other societies. We do not tolerate that people don't fit in. I think it's mostly that, again, that someone fits in, in the collective drugs like alcohol, that's tolerated. But there are other phenomena that are sidelined, nearly repressed. Take old age, for instance, or physical disability sometimes. We don't want to see that. Cancerous people, I took that example earlier, they are also marginalized. It bothers me. Suicidal people, too, we could find a similar equation, or prostitution, it's another phenomenon. If it fits in, it's tolerated, but someone that doesn't behave normally when it comes to sexuality, either those of married life, usual sexuality, or those of prostitution. Someone that doesn't fit in will be marginalized at work, in social rapports. I believe that's how we could situate that problem. Interviewer, as a psychoanalyst, do you use chemical components, medication, or other in your work? Guattari, personally no, but I'm linked to a clinic, Laborde, that uses chemical therapy 